Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, COVID update, May 29th, 2020. Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, statistics, I'm just gonna kind of list out more of the big numbers. So about 360 some thousand in the world have died. Um, about 104,000 in the United States. We had 24,000 more cases in the United States. Um, over the last 24 hours, Oklahoma is pretty stable. Going about, uh, we had one day where we're only at f we're only 40 some this week, but I think we're back up to 80, um, a little around 340 deaths. Uh, so everything's just kind of going like that. Um, we're not having uh, uptick in cases, uh, but we're not. It's not going away either, which then makes you start thinking: if it's never going away, um, then we're going to get a second wave. It's just something to think about. But again, we have to see what happens over the next month because if it really persists through um, the summer, the first month of the summer with the heat, uh, we know pretty much for sure it's going to be here in full force in uh, the fall. A uh, couple things to go over. First, just a local thing. I mean, I'm part of a, uh, I operate at a group of hospitals and we've been doing screening now for about three weeks on every patient who has surgery. We've done 1,600 tests was the update today from our CEO. We've had one positive uh, COVID test result and that's really pretty reassuring I think for at least the people in Oklahoma. Uh, th that person was asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. We're screening every single uh, surgical patient, every single um, colonoscopy patient, um, pretty much anyone who has an anesthetic. Um, we're following the state guidelines very, very exactly to be clear, uh, but really a very low incidence. I was, we were thinking it would be much higher, but so far, and it's one in 1600, um, and it's a good sampling. It's predominantly Oklahoma City people, uh, but there's a smattering of people from all over the state who use our facilities and the physicians that operate at our hospital system. So um, that's really, I think, positive that there's not more positives. Um, for where we're, we're heading in Oklahoma right now. And if something to think about, um, there was, I've talked a lot about school stuff lately and someone uh, sent a message, well, what about Quebec? I mean, they opened their schools and, and they had you know 40 cases, 20 kids, 20 adults. So the first thing is, it's just France all over again, <laughs> okay? This, this, it's all about knowing the data and I want everyone to understand the data. When France opened uh, more than a month ago or roughly a month ago, the first two weeks they had 70 cases across um, whatever part of France opened the schools, which was the northern part and I think Paris. Um, all those cases were pre-existing. It takes about 14 days, for somewhere between seven and 14 days minimally for the cases to hit once someone gets exposed. I'm gonna go over a data set on that out of China. Um, in right after this. So the people in Quebec who pop positive were all within the first 14 days. Um, so they already had it. They didn't get it from the school. The second part of that is like in France, there wasn't a, there wasn't any uptick in deaths in those children or anything like that. No reports of it. And there wasn't then secondarily um, so far any secondary pulse from the schools then which again, in France, which confirms the whole theory that the kids really aren't that infectious. They may get it, but they don't infect anyone. Um, and I'm gonna be going over some Chinese data. I, I put a post out on that a little earlier so people can look at the reference uh, too. But let's talk a little bit more about this Chinese data where they followed 24 people um, in the, and with repetitive testing and they knew they'd been exposed and they knew they had viral particles present. And so it was really kind of, cool they did this study because it showed that some people will start shedding virus uh, and be potentially infectious as soon as you know five to seven days but a huge number of them were 14 to 20 days or longer with before they were really shedding virus that was detectable um, in terms of being in, potentially infectious and one person was viral positive for 32 days so this whole thing we're kind of stuck with is it does take a little longer for a lot of people to pop at first is oh it's going to be in the first seven or the first 12 and like the person who exposed me they were 17 days out from their exposure most likely at least before they got sick 
um, and that's what we're seeing. So you can get exposed, it can kind of be in your system without activating, and then it can turn on. Um, but the thing again with the children is it's not turning on much into anything. And that segues into another really, really cool Chinese study that was published recently that looked at pediatric cases in two different uh, hospital systems uh, and provinces in China. And a lot of the children who ended up coming in were coming in just to be tested because so many family members were um, sick at home. And so there were 71 kids in this study who hit the hospitals. Um, the first and most important thing in the study, and I put this in the previous post um, today, is that 96% of the infections were clearly only from a family member or member of the household who was already infected. They were not a community acquired, and that's been consistent data, is you, when you lock someone in the home uh, with who's infected with a whole bunch of non-infected people, you can infect them. Um, and that's what happened in New York when, when all those COVID patients who were able to be discharged got sent back to the nursing homes. They infected everyone in the nursing homes and it ended up killing between four and 16,000 extra people. Again, not criticizing it, just observing it. COVID people shed virus for a long time and so we have to have a solution for that in terms of being able to have them go home and be isolated at home once they're feeling a little better or something. Um, so that was the first thing. 96% of the children were definitely infected from uh, a someone in the home, the other 4%, they did not know where they'd been infected from. Um, number two, uh, initially 40, more than 40% roughly were asymptomatic and with further testing they could, they could find some things going on with about half that group. So it ended, it ended up being about um, 20 of them were completely asymptomatic and 20 of them, or almost 20 of them, were very mildly affected. Now, when we look at this data, it becomes really, really interesting. Because of the kids who came in, one child required a few days in the hospital, um, and that child was a 13-year-old who weighed over 200 pounds. So there, other than that, they did not have any comorbidities amongst the group, with a big caveat, which I'm about to tell you. Um, so that child did have a little bit of a comorbidity, and that child did did not need a ventilator, but they gave him some uh, support, respiratory support with what's called BiPAP, um, I think just to be careful, but his oxygen saturation never dropped below 92%, which you know, is a, a relatively mild pneumonia for a child. But the really interesting thing about this study gets to, they tested 34 of the kids who were symptomatic or sort of symptomatic for more than COVID. And it turned out more than 50% of them had other serious respiratory infections. 33% of the kids tested had a walking pneumonia. They had mycoplasm. Um, they didn't even test for ureaplasm, which is a more, um, to an extent, almost more common in the United States. I mean, I've seen as many ureaplasms on DNA swabs as I have mycoplasms, but that isn't what we do first line, um, that cause walking pneumonia. And a bunch of them had mononucleosis, several had mononucleosis, some had mononucleosis and walking pneumonia and COVID, um, and then some had um, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV for you uh, parents who've had gone through that with your kids who were two or three. Um, so this compendium of these children, 50% of them had serious um, other respiratory pathogens. So it then it becomes, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it, is it the COVID? Is it the other thing? Is it the combination? Um, and a lot of the kids didn't get tested for anything else. And I can tell you in the United States, I'm not thinking when, we're, when, when I've seen adults who've gotten checked initially, they were checked for influenza and they were checked for... Um, COVID, the first thing popping into everyone's mind has not been, oh, I better check for um, cytomegalovirus or I need to check for uh, mycoplasm. Now, some of the advanced testing that will be done, some places have it, but clearly that's not been our thought process. So this is 
amazing data that we need to start thinking about. And it gets to why Zithromax, when you've heard about the Zithromax, may actually be important because what do you use to treat walking pneumonia? Zithromax or Avalox or doxycycline, but Zithromax has kind of been more of the standard. Um, it doesn't cover all the, the strains of mycoplasm, but it will cover most. Avalox is better if you really want to hit it. But the issue here is, again, data showing that perhaps these respiratory infections in some of these patients are actually quite complex. And if we don't survey them for all of them, we're gonna miss some and we're not gonna treat things completely, which is gonna to lead to untoward outcomes. But when we look at the kids again, all 71 kids did great. Um, other than the one kid who did get BiPAP for a couple days, they didn't really need much of anything. And as the previous Chinese data has shown, the number one supportive care for um, children is just give them oxygen. The only other thing that showed any semblance of help was alpha interferon, and that was very minor. And remember, if you've heard me talk at all, zinc raises alpha interferon by a thousand percent. So that's always a conceptual thought for people. If your zinc's low, your alpha interferon levels are low. So really cool and remarkable data from that study. And it makes us start thinking, hey, what's going on here? There's, this is a much more complex disease event than we thought. Um, likewise, the Yale epidemiologist, Dr. I think it's Rish, Rish something like that, um, put out a report yesterday in the Journal of Epidemiology showing that uh, Plaquenil does actually work incredibly well. He recommended that it become a first-line therapy for outpatient, um, outpatient treatment. I'll put that, I couldn't get a hold of his report because I just read a little snippet of it um, before I did this and I'll get that out tomorrow. But really invigorating data um, that someone from Yale uh, has said that the head of epidemiology there. Interestingly enough, I reviewed the Yale protocol in all their hospitals and their systems. First line therapy for every single patient who goes to Yale is hydroxychloroquine. Now they've not promoted that, but that's what they do because they think it works. Kind of interesting stuff. And then their second thing they give is uh, an interleukin-6 uh, blocker or antagonist. Interleukin-6 and interleukin beta, which I've talked about before, um, are what lead to cytokine storm. The natural thing that suppresses them is melatonin. Um, and again, little kids have lots of melatonin, but so it's kind of interesting, you know, Plaquenil and then an incredibly difficult to pronounce drug. So I'm not even gonna try because you know how hard it was for me to even say Fauci for three months. So um, kind of okay not to be able to say the name, but I'll, I'll put that little report out or snippet on their protocol to see that maybe some of this stuff makes sense. So that's the big ticket items right now. And so just wanted to update everyone. Um, I would encourage everyone to be on their vitamins, their supplements. Um, I've gotten some stuff on Dr. Marcola. I think not, nothing he's saying is really new, but I think it's fairly accurate that the vitamin C data has been pretty helpful for inpatients who are sick with COVID. I mean, I'm a strong, strong believer in the vitamin D data already. Uh, the multivitamin use for immune support. And obviously I think zinc and iodine are very important. And I think that's all on the right track and very reasonable for all of us. I mean, hitting the RDA requirements minimally is going to be helpful. And I think there's support for using a little bit higher levels of zinc. And I always think vitamin D needs to be at 5,000 per person, depending on weight or 10,000. So anyway, that's uh, the update. Have a great weekend. It's beautiful here in Oklahoma right now. And uh, take care.